Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Nick Dirks, uh, and as Chancellor of UC Berkeley, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you all to the second of the 2017 Clark Kerr Lectures. As you know, this lecture series honors Clark Kerr, president of the University of California from 1958 to 1967, and long recognized as one of the great leaders of American higher education in the 20th century. Kerr came to UC Berkeley in 1945 as an associate professor of industrial relations and was our first chancellor from 1952 to 1958. After his years here and at the helm of the UC system, Kerr headed the Carnegie Commission on Higher Education and then the Carnegie Council on Policy Studies in Higher Education. He was a prolific writer and commentator on higher education nearly up until his death in 2003. Perhaps Kerr's best known work was The Uses of the University, a book based on his own Godkin lectures given at Harvard in 1963 while he was still president. In that book, Kerr was prescient about many things, both in what he wrote in the lectures themselves and in the additional reflections he inserted in five different editions, the last of which he published in 2001. In the first edition, he noted that the age of giants, and he used that term to refer to the great college and university presidents of the period between 1870 and 1920, might have to return. He anticipated the need for significant change in the years after 1960, and he felt that, the new pres that new presidential giants were needed to give leadership to these changes. As he wrote, I quote, virtually all successful major reforms or revolutions in the act, I'm just quoting, just I have to, <laughs> virtually, <laughs> I hasten to say, this is a quote. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually all successful major reforms or revolutions in the academic world have come into being and probably will continue to come into being through leadership from the top or from the outside, through the instrumentality of an Eliot or a Napoleon. End of quote. Now, of course, he could have been, and I suspect he was, describing his own desired self-characterization. And there is no doubt that his work in crafting the master plan for higher education in California and in establishing the new experimental campuses in Santa Cruz and San Diego, among many other things, uh, confers on him the metaphor of being a giant in higher education indeed. But despite his extraordinary adeptness in handling the first crises around student activism in the 1960s, even those were not easy days for giants, as Kerr himself discovered when he was unceremoniously fired by Ronald Reagan in January of 1967. Indeed, in a later edition, he noted that he only learned later how dangerous it can be to confront the myths and illusions of universities in contentious times. But with all of his prescience and all of his recognition of the changes that technological advance globalization and the need for more attention to undergraduate education, in part to ward off stu student alienation, all th that this would entail, even Kerr did not fully appreciate the financial challenges that have made the task of leadership far more difficult in years after he stepped down than when he was in office. He predicted that there would be, in writings about the challenges of the future, he predict predicted a number of things, that there would be necessarily more privatization and for public universities, more need for the cultivation of general public support and more uh, necessary attention to the effective use of resources. But in this last area, wrote only that, and I quote again, costs could be more carefully scrutinized, end of quote. As I believe we'll hear today, sentences like this have to be written in somewhat less tentative ways, to say the least. Now established in 2001, the Clark Kerr Lectures, were modeled on Kerr's own Godkin lectures as they provide a forum for analysis and reflection about the forces shaping universities and the complex and evolving roles that such institutions play in society today. This year, we've taken a minor departure from our tradition of inviting one, one speaker every two years and instead, this is the jackpot, have invited three prominent scholars each to give one lecture on the critical topic of finance and sustainability in higher education. Last week, we heard from the Spencer Foundation's president, Michael McPherson, who in a talk about the future of college access outlined how society should tackle 
the dual goals of meeting the needs of the current college generation, while also investing in systems that will provide a firmer grounding for equal college opportunity 20 or so years down the line. I hope you'll join us next Thursday when we hear from Coursera CEO and former president of Yale, Rick Levin, who will present his argument for why public universities deserve more support, as well as discuss cost controls and how colleges can expand their uh, reach through online education. But today, I have the great pleasure of introducing Lawrence S. Bacall, president of Tufts University from September 2001 to July of 2011, and currently leader in residence at the Center for Public Leadership and at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. Now, during his 10 years as the president of Tufts, Larry advanced the university's role as a leader in teaching, research, and public service, building on Tufts' historic strengths to enhance the undergraduate experience, deepen graduate and professional education and research in critical fields, broadening uh, international engagement, and fostering active citizenship among uh, members of the university community, among many other things. He emphasized increased collaboration among Tufts, Tufts eight schools and generated creativity and enthusiasm for interdisciplinary study. Nationally, he also became well known as an advocate for broader access to higher education and the importance of need-based financial aid. After stepping down as president of Tufts, Larry served for three years as president in residence in the higher education program at Harvard's Graduate School of Education before taking on his current role at Harvard's Kennedy School. He's also a senior advisor to Ithaca SNR and was one of the authors of its major 2012 study of barriers to the adoption of online learning systems in American higher education. He serves as a member of the Lincoln Project of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and is a member of the Harvard Corporation. Prior to becoming president of Tufts, Larry served on the MIT faculty for 24 years, including the last three as chancellor. No higher title than that. A lawyer and economist by training, he received his bachelor's in economics from MIT, his JD from Harvard Law School, and his MPP and PhD from Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. The title of today's talk is The Political Economy of Cost Control on a University Campus. Please join me in welcoming Lawrence Bacon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chancellor Dirks, for that um, exceedingly generous introduction. Um, let me first say how honored I am to be here today um, to give this lecture. While I never had the opportunity to meet Clark Kerr, I almost feel that I know him, because like most university presidents, I've found the opportunity to quote him extensively um, over the years. I've cited his pithy observations about universities, about leadership, about governance, um, more times uh, than I care to admit. Uh, indeed, I think for most of us who've had the privilege of leading institutions like this, um, we could almost all claim to be students of Dr. Kerr because we've learned from his bold leadership and his thoughtful uh, writings about higher education. I think it's also true that everyone in higher education in the United States in some ways uh, is indebted to Clark Kerr for the legacy that he created that is the University of California system. Um, while your system faces many challenges, I don't have to tell uh, you, and we'll talk a little bit more about those um, later on this afternoon, um, I think it remains the model uh, for higher education uh, in so many ways uh, in the United States and, and in some ways throughout the world. Many governors and many system presidents have succeeded in encouraging their legislatures to be more generous to their own university systems by just observing that their state deserves a public university system as good as California's. Um, and it is a special honor to give this particular lecture um, at Berkeley, uh, truly the jewel in the crown of public higher education in America. Now trust me, coming from yours truly, that's a very strong statement. Because what you don't know about me is that I grew up in the shadow of the University of Michigan uh, and to continue to root for the Wolverines. Um, but Berkeley is indeed special. It's also an honor to give this lecture because one of my predecessors in giving this lecture was the late Chuck Vest, uh, former president of MIT. 
Um, I owe much of my career to Chuck. He plucked me from being a relatively obscure faculty member and bestowed this magnificent title chancellor upon me. And in the course of doing so, um, you know, truly uh, changed my life. It's also a pleasure to be able to share this honor um, with Mike McPherson and Rick Levin. Mike and I are actually co-authors. Um, we've worked together. We have written together uh, before. I've learned a great deal from him. Um, and he's been a wonderful colleague. And I've always admired Rick and his leadership of Yale. It's still hard to believe that anybody could do this job for 20 years, but Rick did. Uh, and I admire his willingness to uh, step into the fray um, once again now uh, to lead Coursera. I've entitled my lecture, The Political Economy of Cost Control on a University Campus because it provides me with an opportunity to reflect upon my own experiences and candidly some of my own failures uh, to rein in costs, um, both as chancellor of MIT, and for those of you who are wondering what a chancellor is, it's basically a half a provost. Um, Chuck Vest decided that um, the provost job was overwhelming provosts and he needed two people to do it at one point and asked Bob Brown, now the president of Boston University and myself to basically divide the responsibilities. And Bob and I did that and Bob took out a good chunk of them with the title uh, provost and I got the, the balance with the title chancellor. But this lecture gives me a, the opportunity to think about and talk to you a little bit about some of my failures to rein in costs during my tenure as chancellor and then 10 years as president of Tufts um, and now um, participating in conversations um, at Harvard. And yes, indeed, even Harvard worries a little bit um, about um, rising costs, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps not enough. Um, so um, no doubt you will have observed that my own administrative experience uh, is exclusively in private institutions. Um, and while I believe there are many similarities in the challenges which are faced by both public and private institutions, um, there are also some important differences. Uh, and I'll try to highlight a few of those. And for those that I miss, um, I'm going to rely upon all of you to point out the rest um, in the conversation that I hope we will have in the time in which uh, will be available for comments. So I'd like to make four arguments today. The first argument I'd like to make is the greatest challenge facing higher education um, is bending the cost curve. The second argument I'd like to make is that doing so is incredibly hard for a variety of reasons, but not the least of which is that there is no natural constituency for cost control on a university campus. And as you will see, this is actually the crux of my argument. Third, I'd like to suggest that in those instances where costs have been successfully moderated, it's all, almost always due to exogenous constraints on revenue that force institutions uh, to cut back. Um, all right, that is indeed the forcing function that changes the politics. I don't have to say that to anybody on this campus. You're, you're all nodding. And then finally, if we wish to see more progress on cost control, I think we need more cooperation among colleges and universities or perhaps to put it a little bit more sharply, we need to limit competition that I think drives costs um, in higher education. So I look forward to your comments and to discussion, which I hope we can have. I'm gonna try and make sure we leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, as I like to say, I, I always know what I'm gonna say. I never learn anything when I hear me say it, uh, but I hope I can learn something uh, from our collective conversation. So the biggest challenge facing higher education. I used to believe that it was access. Um, by access, I mean the need to ensure that talented students had the opportunity to, to obtain a superb education regardless of the ability of their families uh, to pay. And traditionally, higher education has functioned um, as the principal means, I think, for achieving social mobility in this country. 
Uh, indeed, college has functioned as an escalator in which students could get on this escalator um, who came from very, very modest means and relatively quickly be projected uh, into the upper ranks of the socioeconomic sp um, spectrum of society. To put it another way, traditionally, higher education has enabled the American dream. And I think because of that, it has traditionally been able to command political support very easily um, in this country. Now, unfortunately, access remains a challenge. Not only is it still hard for many um, talented but poor students to get the education that they need to succeed, but recent research uh, by David Autor um, at MIT and Raj Chetty, who's now down the street um, at Stanford, and others suggest that higher education may actually be contributing uh, to income uh, and wealth inequality in this country. Uh, and that in and of itself is something that should give all of us pause and should cause all of us who are in a position to influence the behavior of institutions like this to ask, what can we do uh, to correct this? So if access remains problematic, why do I believe that bending the cost curve is the biggest challenge that we face? Because I think if we fail to cut the growth um, in college costs, will not only price many students and their families out of the market, but I think we also risk all of public support for higher education. And lacking that support, we will never make progress um, on access. We may also jeopardize the financial foundation on which our colleges and universities um, rest. So just a little data uh, to, to underscore this argument. In 2001, the average tuition, fees, room, and board for an in-state student at a public four-year college or university represented 21% of median family income. Okay, 21% in 2001. By 2015, that number had climbed to 35%. Now, admittedly, these numbers focus on sticker price, um, but it is sticker price that indeed gets the attention of legislators, op-ed writers, and increasingly the electorate. It's also true that during the same period, we've seen a shift away from need-based aid to merit aid. Um, put another way, financial aid to the middle and upper middle classes is actually growing at a faster rate than financial aid for the poor, something which should also concern us greatly. Now, another point that uh, does not need much emphasis is about the only thing where costs are rising faster than health care, or at least prices rising faster than health care, and I want to come back to that, uh, is in higher education. Now, these trends cannot go on forever, and one of the things which we know about things which cannot go on forever is that eventually they come to an end. <laughs> and when they do, it tends not to be um, very pretty. Now, to be sure, much of the increase in tuition and fees that I've just quoted is attributable to the shift in costs from the taxpayer to students and their families as the public sector has disinvested in support for higher education. You all know that exceedingly well. But that is exactly my point, and that we should be concerned about more shifts like this, and I believe that part of it is at least in response to not just tough economic times, um, but rather real skepticism about the ability of institutions like ours to actually manage the resources that are entrusted to us in a prudent way. Now, I would just like to note that if you think it's better in the private sector, in some ways it is, and I'll come back to that. But even the wealthiest private institutions, I believe, ignore rising costs at their peril. Why? Well, we are all dependent on the federal government uh, for support, whether or not it is research support, indirect cost recovery, Pell Grants, guaranteed student loans, you name it. 
Uh, it's not just those institutions that look uh, to the government for state appropriations, it's everybody. We're also tremendously exposed uh, to changes in tax policy that would limit the charitable deduction, that would potentially subject endowments uh, to federal taxation, or would challenge the tax exempt status of our real estate holdings. My point is that we continue to let college costs rise at our peril um, in every institution, and in every constituency on every institution has an interest in trying to bend the cost curve. And it's even more true, I think, of the elite institutions. And the reason I say that is because the press tends to pay a lot more attention to what we do um, than everybody, everybody else. I think you know that from experiences just today. Um, so why is cost control so difficult? Um, so argument number two. In their classic study on the performing arts, uh, Will Baumel and Bill Bowen observed that in any industry in which productivity growth lags that of society writ large, um, costs will escalate faster than inflation. And higher education is a classic example of just such an industry. Uh, you know, the production function for higher education really hasn't changed in hundreds, maybe even thousands of years. Uh, to a first approximation, we're still educating students the same way we were ages ago, um, with chalk and talk, or the sage on the stage. In fact, uh, this lecture is a good example of the durability of the lecture format, uh, which is familiar to all. Uh, you know, why did some of you schlep a long ways just to sit here so we could do this in person when you, know, you could have watched it on the web, or, uh, either currently or at some point in the future? Now, there's some hope that online education will radically transform the educational production function. Uh, but the jury is still out on that one. And while I personally believe, having spent a fair amount of time studying it, that online education will only get better over time, I'm actually skeptical that it's going to bring about a radical transformation in the cost structure of universities. Uh, and we can talk about the nature of my skepticism if you will, um, in, the, uh, in the discussion period. But beyond Baumel Bowen cost disease, I would like to argue that it's difficult to control costs in a university, especially a research university, precisely because there is no natural constituency that supports such efforts. But before I get to the crux of this argument, um, I'd like to tell you a story. Shortly after I was named president of Tufts, Paul Gray, the former president of MIT, who I suspect is known to many of you, pulled me aside and said, Larry, let me tell you what your life is about to be like. Listen closely, Carol. Um, he said, trying to lead a research university is like trying to navigate an 18-wheeler down an icy, hilly mountain road one that has no guardrails, okay, and that has 1,000 foot drop-offs. And if that wasn't hard enough, okay, students have their hands, uh, excuse me, faculty have their hands on the wheel, students have their feet on the accelerator, and the trustees have their feet on the brake. And by the way, you're responsible for the outcome. Now, Every time I tell this story, it always gets a chuckle. Um, but I think it illustrates, in some ways, the core of the problem. Every university president or campus chancellor uh, needs to pay attention to at least three major constituencies. The faculty first, students, and then, for those of us who have boards, uh, boards of trustees, who in some cases are proxies for the alumni, for others, people with a very long-term vested interest in the future of the institution. To be sure, there are others who matter. I don't mean to diminish you know, um, alumni directly, or staff, um, or neighbors, or government officials. But you know, faculty, students, and the board are always front of mind uh, for any college or university president. And if you want to bring about thoughtful, meaningful change in an institution like this, 
it's almost a necessity that you agitate at least one of those groups uh, and get them excited about what you're going to do. And I maintain that you can sort of survive if you get one of them excited, but it's very, very difficult. If you get two of these groups, or worse yet, three of them upset with you at any particular point in time. Now, as we start to unpack things and explore the interests of these constituencies, what becomes very clear very quickly is that on many issues that bear on cost control, the interests of students and the faculty align quite closely. And as we will see, trustees, interestingly, are not far behind. Consider the question of the curriculum. One driver of costs on a university campus is what I like to describe as curricular entropy. Uh, all right. There's enormous pressure, uh, often from students, um, but from others as well, to expand the curriculum, to have more flavors of different subjects, to have more majors, to have more minors. Uh, in fact, one of the big shifts that's occurred, I think, since at least I was a student 100 years ago, is most of us graduated with a major. But if you talk to students these days, they're double majoring in this and minoring in that. I think part of this behavior is an attempt to just differentiate themselves um, from their colleagues. Uh, but it, uh, you know, clearly students are interested in seeing that the curriculum um, uh, expand. Um, now, uh, what's interesting about that is that Curricular entropy, curricular expansion, places additional demands upon faculty. Um, it places additional demands upon classroom space, um, on other teaching resources, uh, TAs, um, uh, to help with, uh, with teaching. Um, it places additional demands on student advising as the curriculum becomes more complicated. Navigating your way through it becomes harder. Um, and it also, I think, raises the bar for students finishing their degrees on time. Because some students proceed down back alleys and they have to turn around uh, and, and they waste time, they can waste semesters, they can waste years um, by making, either being confused about how they plan their education um, or even by making bad decisions. Now, not surprisingly, as I said, students uh, favor more curricular options. And faculty are often all too willing to support them. Um, faculty also um, like to see the curriculum expand. Why? Because it creates the demand for more faculty. And in some cases, it creates the demand for more specialized uh, faculty. So um, here's a case where student interest and faculty interests align quite closely. It's also true that they align almost perfectly when it comes to issues of class size, right? Students like to take small classes. Faculty typically like to teach small classes. Um, consider class scheduling. Now, I don't know what it's like at Berkeley, but at every ca campus that I've ever taught on, you know, these days there aren't a lot of Friday classes. Students don't like to take Friday classes. And guess what? Faculty don't like to teach Friday classes. You know, given a choice, they'd rather confine all of their teaching between Tuesday and Thursday. Um, another case of alignment. Uh, students don't like to take classes real early in the morning. Faculty often don't like to teach them as well. Well, what does this mean? It means that our classroom resources, um, which are real sunk costs, are grossly underutilized. Uh, as everybody tries to con you know, cram their desired teaching into the same um, blocks of, of time. Um, now, um, I don't mean to suggest that student and faculty interests are perfectly aligned, they're not, but they're sufficiently around, aligned around a set of core issues regarding the curriculum, class size, and class scheduling to make it difficult to reduce instructional costs by rationalizing both the curriculum and the scheduling of classes. Let's take a little bit of a closer look at the interests of first students and their families and then faculty also on these issues of, uh, uh, of cost control. Um, now, while it's not unusual for students and their parents to rail about the high cost of tuition, when I was at MIT, we used to have the annual tuition riot. I don't know if that exists uh, here at Berkeley whenever tuition increases were announced. Um, one rarely hears 
by the way, I, I remember my freshman year, the riot was over um, the saying, 2150 is too damn much. That was the tuition in, in 1969 for a year at MIT, $2,150, how times have changed. Um, now, what, it's not unusual for students and their parents to rail against the high cost of tuition. One rarely hears either group advocate for specific efforts to reduce the cost of a college education other than just lowering the price. Economists are fond of distinguishing price from cost. Um, but as costs rise, prices tend to rise as well. We know how to make higher education cheaper. It's really not that difficult. It's called bigger classes. It's called less student-faculty contact. It's called less of expensive hands-on learning. Um, it's called fewer curricular options. It's called simpler facilities, um, less support for athletics, for co-curricular life. Um, I could go on. We actually know how to do it. In 10 years as president of Tufts and three years as chancellor of MIT, not once, not once did I have a student or their parent come into my office, pound the table, and demand that I do any of those things and, and, and lower prices. Not once. And I'm, looking around at people who've had similar jobs and they're nodding their heads because I expect they've had the, uh, the same experience. Now, I think there are a number of explanations for this kind of behavior. Part of it is attributable to the fact that competition in higher education drives costs up. In this sector, we do not reward the least cost provider. To the contrary, it works almost exactly the opposite. Institutions, I think, actually compete by advertising their relative inefficiencies. They promote low student-faculty ratios. Um, and that's just another way of sort of saying that, you know, we are the most labor-intensive institution around. You will not see many organizations brag about things like that. Yet we do. We brag about, you know, low class size, small class size, the ease of, of getting access to faculty. And believe me, those are great things. The question is, how much of those can we afford uh, to pay for? Um, but our institutions also advertise you know, first-rate facilities, the number of clubs and student organizations, the ease of starting them, the opportunities to participate in a wide variety of activities, all of which um, have costs associated with them. So it's also true that the way we price higher education tends to decouple the price from the cost of providing that education. Because of public subsidies, um, both direct subsidies in terms of state appropriations, but also implicit subsidies that come in terms of tax benefits, um, and because of endowment support and other philanthropic support, gifts for current use, even full pay students pay only a fraction of the true cost um, of their education. Financial aid further insulates students uh, from uh, the linkage between price and cost. Now, please understand, I'm not arguing against financial aid. I'm not arguing against public support for higher education. To the contrary, uh, we should have more of both. Um, I just want to point out that if you fix the price that any student or their family will pay for their education. It is in their interest and the interest of their families to then advocate for the, for the institution to spend as much as possible educating that student beyond the, the portion of the, that price the student or their family will incur themselves. Um, so it's why we, we, we always see the demand for more and more by students um, and their families. One way of thinking about this is, um, uh, in some ways, higher education and the way we price it is a classic case of third-party payment, um, right? And in the same way as in healthcare, if you don't have co-pays, if you don't have co-insurance, if all you have is a deductible, once people have met their deductible, um, they have little incentive to constrain their demand for consumption of additional healthcare. And it sort of works in higher education um, as well. So, you know, once people have paid what they're going to pay, they have no problems. If you have 24 varsity sports, advocating for 25. If you have tons, 10 study abroad programs, we should have 11. 
Um, and moreover, any effort to save money by economizing on the student experience will be experienced by the students, in fact, as a takeaway. I think it's also true that our egalitarian traditions and our commitment to egalitarianism um, uh, sometimes frustrates efforts to introduce lower cost alternatives for some of our students. I was surprised when I came to Tufts to learn that Tufts prices its housing exactly the same for all students on campus, regardless of whether or not they live in a single in the newest and best dormitory on campus, or if they have a double or a triple in the oldest and worst maintained residence on campus. And I see some people shaking their heads, so this is a phenomenon that you may be uh, familiar with. And the rationale for doing this is that if we were um, to ration housing by price, then the rich students would live in, in one place and the poor students would live someplace else. Um, but another consequence of such a policy is that the inability to upcharge um, for newer housing makes it that much more difficult for the institution to find the resources to upgrade its housing stock, um, to properly maintain its housing stock, and actually to build new housing uh, for, its, uh, for its students. And because of this policy has produced underinvestment, at least on the Tufts campus, you know, I can report to you that many students are forced to move off campus, because we don't have enough housing to house all students on campus, in their junior or senior year. They have to go into the marketplace uh, to find such housing. And guess what the marketplace does? It rations by price, and so rich students live one place and poor students uh, live someplace else. So we, we wind up with the exactly uh, the same, um, the same uh, outcome. By contrast, MIT, where I came from, um, has a, you know, differentiates in price um, among its dormitories. There are low-cost alternatives, which are um, appreciated, in fact, um, by some students and their families who wish to economize on the full cost of an MIT education. Also, our commitment to educate talented students regardless of their ability to pay comes at a cost. And here I'm not talking about financial aid. Uh, we know and now understand much better what it takes for first-generation and low-income students not just to be admitted to our institutions, not just to graduate from our institutions, but to actually thrive while they are here. Um, they often require more advising um, and more efforts to level the playing field so that these students can experience an MIT education, a Tufts education, a Harvard education, a Berkeley education, in a way that does not distinguish them uh, from their classmates who come from more modest means. So to close the conversation about students and their families, I don't think that we should be surprised that they are rarely advocates for cost control because they don't see how they're gonna benefit from such efforts given the weak lim linkage between cost and price um, of their education. Uh, indeed, their behavior is quite rational. If you take a look at the US News and World Report rankings, um, they are almost perfectly correlated with expenditures per student. Um, so if, you know, if you're interested in prestige, you want to go to the place that spends the most to educate students. Um, and, and students and their fa families uh, pursue um, such, uh, such behavior all the time. So again, our commitment to equity which I'm not arguing against, we should understand, comes with significant costs. Our decoupling of price and costs means that students and their families will almost never be advocates uh, for cost control once they're on our campuses. How about the interests of, fac uh, of faculty? I had a colleague at MIT, some of you may know him, David Marks, um, a civil engineer. David used to say, faculty are people who think otherwise. Now, while this comment also almost always gets a laugh, I think that there's more than a bit of truth to it. Um, but I would like to argue that this inclination to think otherwise is actually what makes faculty great scholars. Uh, okay? um, it's what empowers them, enables them to challenge conventional wisdom in their scholarship to advance new knowledge. It, it, it's what leads them to focus single-mindedly um, sometimes only on one question or one problem for years at a time in their search for truth. Um, and to treat any distraction from their work as an assault on their professional identity. 
And it, does, it is also what leads them, especially our colleagues in the humanities, um, uh, to be professional skeptics and critics. Indeed, we educate our graduate students to do so, uh, right, to be great critics, articulate critics, um, and to apply that skepticism and critical faculty uh, to almost anything, um, including pronouncements by university presidents on the need for cost control and the effectiveness of the policies that we are, in fact, putting forward. Now, in pursuing their scholarship, what most faculty jealously guard is their control over the scholarly process. Most just want to be left alone to do their work um, and to do it in an almost artisanal or craft-like way. And here's where I think efforts to achieve administrative efficiencies encounter most faculty resistance. Very few colleges and universities um, were actually designed with the goal of achieving administrative efficiency, uh, right? It was not at the top of the list when the organizational structure emerged. Uh, most, you know, most places evolved over time, often opportunistically, sort of reflecting either intellectual opportunities that were presented by particular moments in time. We need to uh, do work um, on, in a particular field because we have the capacity to do it now that we didn't before. Or um, in some cases because there were resource opportunities. There was money to do something. Sometimes we've even organized whole schools or departments or centers or laboratories um, around the entrepreneurial efforts of a small group of, of incredible faculty or in some cases even just one faculty member. Uh, we certainly had plenty of centers at MIT uh, where one faculty member had a great idea, could find the resources, and they were off and running. I suspect you have a few of those um, uh, here, too. Now, the administrative structure that emerges to support these activities has also evolved to serve the faculty who are pursuing these ideas. Um, indeed, you know, I think the administrative structure has often been locally optimized to serve these, these faculty. Um, now, inevitably, this process produces redundancy, um, whether it's redundancy in libraries. Um, Harvard recently went through a process of trying to rationalize it. And, you know, we had something like seven, how many, Susan, 60 or 70 libraries all over campus. It was, um, it, it's true for IT systems. It's true for purchasing in some cases. It's true for HR. Um, just to name a few, to say nothing about the proliferation of all these different entities on claims for space and the organization of space uh, on a campus. Now, the faculty understand these legacy systems. They like these legacy systems because they've been designed specifically to enable the faculty to do their work and to do it um, effectively. Moreover, these systems are managed by people who are known to the faculty personally. You know, they know who's going to fix their computer when they're having a problem with it, right? They know if there's no chalk in the classroom, who to ask for uh, to, to get them chalk. And the people who provide those services know the faculty as well. Um, now, in this contrast, context, efforts to achieve administrative efficiency almost inevitably come from some degree of centralization. And that centralization means that individual faculty lose a certain amount of control. So for, for the, from the faculty's perspective, this means giving up something that's f familiar for something that is not. It means with dealing, dealing with new people. It means dealing with new processes. It means accepting on face value a claim from somebody like me that, in fact, we're going to provide better service to you at lower cost. Um, if you want to see a skeptical response, say that to a faculty member. Um, and moreover, they typically have to, to give up something uh, first. Uh, most importantly, faculty fear that any efficiency gains will come at the expense of their own personal time, um, time that is better devoted to their scholarship. So skepticism and resistance to this kind of change should not be surprising. When viewed through the eyes of a faculty member, it's actually quite rational. Um, although it may be self-serving, it may be inefficient um, from an institutional standpoint, 
and we know it's also very, very expensive. Now, it's also true that faculty engage in what can, I think, best be characterized as guild-like behavior. Um, perhaps the best example of this I ever saw was at MIT. At MIT, all freshmen are required to take, among other things, a full year of physics and a full year of calculus. And the physics and the math departments jealously guard their prerogative in teaching and offering these courses. Now, there are engineering departments that, in fact, would like to offer their own version of freshman physics or freshman calculus, but the math and, and physics departments will have none of that and oppose it um, you know, vociferously. Even interestingly, when the people who would teach those courses in the engineering departments happen to be graduates of the MIT math and physics departments, all right? Doesn't make any difference. It's not a question of are they well equipped to teach them. Why do they oppose this? Well, in part because it protects the size of their faculty, and more, moreover, it allows them to lay claim to TA ships, which helps subsidize and support their graduate students, and allows them to have more graduate students as opposed to fewer. We've seen similar guild-like behavior by faculty at a number of schools objecting um, to expand online offerings because they worry that they will displace um, faculty locally. Uh, this happened at San Jose State when the institution, institution tried to import Michael Sandel's justice course electronically from Harvard, nearly resulted in a revolution there. And at Harvard, interestingly, the Harvard faculty have at times questioned whether or not Harvard should be in the business of creating online content for use elsewhere. Why? Because it will diminish the employment opportunities for Harvard PhDs at other institutions. Um, so um, I think most of us who've been in administrative positions um, have also experienced resistance to attempts to reallocate faculty resources when faculty members um, uh, retire to better reflect you know, what are the needs uh, at the time? And I'm told of an Ivy League institution that shall remain nameless, that has more than a dozen slots uh, committed to German, uh, with exactly zero students majoring in German and dwindling, ever dwindling enrollments. Things like that drive people like us crazy, especially in a time of diminished uh, resources. I think there's another dimension to faculty behavior that also contributes to skepticism about centralized efforts to control costs. Um, in the 40 years since I became a junior faculty member at MIT, I've noticed that faculty, a drift in faculty identification to align much more closely with their disciplines and less with their institutions. And I don't know if this is true here at Berkeley, uh, but it was certainly true at MIT. I think it's true at Tufts, and we see it at, at Harvard um, as well. I think this disciplinary identification, we can talk about why it's happening, but also further contributes to a lack of support for institutional efforts uh, to conserve resources. It's really much, much harder to ask people to take one for the team when they perceive that the team that they're playing for are their disciplinary colleagues as opposed to the institution that employs them. Um, it's again worth noting that faculty interests also exactly parallel student interests um, when it comes to other things beyond curricular expansion, you know, classroom facilities and other things. Bottom line, faculty are rarely, if ever, um, going to be willing allies in efforts uh, to curb costs. So what about trustees? If faculties and students are unlikely to be allies, um, surely as fiduciaries, we should expect trustees of institutions uh, to support uh, to the idea that an institution ought to live within its means. But in, in thinking about trustees, I think it's important to recognize that most of them are rarely selected for their subject matter expertise. Uh, in fact, in my experience, at least in private institutions, Maybe your regents are different. Um, <laughs> most trustees know relatively little about the nuts and bolts of actually running a university. They typically don't understand academic culture. They don't understand or appreciate shared governance. They don't have knowledge of what faculty do on a day-to-day -day basis. 
they don't understand the fact that research, undergraduate education, and graduate education are joint products. So you can't economize over here to save a little bit of money on undergraduate education without affecting everything else uh, that the institution does. And they're mystified by the complexities of fund accounting. Um, I could go on. My point is that while trustees may be sympathetic to the idea of controlling costs um, and the need to realize efficiencies, they often lack the organizational sophistication to understand what many of the contemplated changes may actually mean uh, for the organization. And, you know, and here I wish I had a dime every time I've heard a trustee saying, why can't you just order the faculty to do this? You know? <laughs> Or why can't you just say, okay, wave a magic wand and we're, all, we're now gonna centralize the following function. Um, all right, people just who are often fiduciaries don't appreciate what's involved. Um, so I also think that most people who are trustees certainly are private institutions. Here's one of the perhaps important differences. Um, have interests other than simply balancing the budget. Most of them are trustees because they care passionately about the mission of the institution. It's why they devote so much time to it. It's why they write large checks to it. And they are indeed stewards of the institution's reputation and would not want to do anything uh, that would see that reputation diminish on their watch. Which is why, given a choice of either trying to address a budgetary problem by just slashing the budget, or trying to solve the problem on the revenue side, they're much more inclined uh, to look uh, for, for new revenues. Now, revenue enhancement through fundraising is usually their first line of defense. But as we all know, if fundraising is not carefully done, um, it can actually be quite expensive. Rare is the gift that pays 100% of the marginal cost of a new activity. There are always additional costs, whether or not there's space or, or actual budget or overhead or support or whatever. Um, and that as a result, gifts that don't go to support core needs often wind up taxing the unrestricted resources um, of the institution. Um, and even when a gift endows a new activity completely, all right, you raise 100% of the money to endow it. One of the things which we know is that endowments go up and endowments go down. And when they go down, what you're left with is 100% of the costs and the liabilities to the donor and a fraction of the resources uh, to cover those costs, at which point the new activity once again becomes a claim on the general resources uh, of, the, of the institution. So to put it slightly differently, if, if you're not careful about how you raise money uh, capital campaigns can actually weaken institutions financially. The more you raise, actually, um, the digger the hole uh, you, you dig for yourself. I think the true measure of success is not how much money you raise, um, but rather whether or not you strengthen an institution through fundraising both financially and intellectually. If you don't do both, you probably haven't done it uh, successfully. The latter requires raising money for core intellectual activities or raising resources that are either unrestricted or budget relieving. Um, by the way, I think as we all know, under recovery of indirect costs um, means that research also does not pay for itself. So expanding the research base also typically uh, represents um, a claim on, on institutional resources. So beyond fundraising, the only resource, the only revenue source that trustees control directly is tuition and fees. Um, and the UCC system is obviously quite different here because your tuition is not set by each individual campus, it's set centrally. Um, but in most research, research institutions, there are five or six different sources of revenue. Um, if we look at them, tuition and fees and auxiliary services, in a state institution, appropriations, research volume, income on the endowment, gifts for current use, and intellectual property revenue. Um, currently, all of these resources, all these revenue sources, are under pressure. But one of the things which I've observed that in good economic times, 
there's rarely any pressure to contain tuition growth. You know, the market will bear it. And indeed, I've heard many trustees saying, oh, no, no. You know, if you, if you, if you don't increase tuition, you've lost that increment forever. Uh, okay, so let's not do it. We may need it at some point in, in the future. And in bad economic times, tuition's the only revenue source that you control. So in good times, it goes up. In bad times, uh, it goes up. Uh, and I think that represents um, a challenge for us. Now, one important distinction here between public and private institutions is that in public institutions, it's my understanding that some of your regents, not just in California, but elsewhere. Again, I'm from Michigan. Uh, the regents of the University of Michigan are actually elected in a statewide party ballot. Uh, okay. um, but in, in public institutions, some of these fiduciaries see themselves as more fiduciaries of the taxpayer than they do of, of the institution itself. Um, by, by contrast, trustees are selected in different ways at, uh, at, at private institutions. Um, so we don't have people campaigning um, to be a regent on the promise of cutting costs. Um, you do have that in the public sector. But I would also tell you that those people tend to be, as you know, enormously disruptive in the way in which they go about doing this. Uh, you probably have stories that you can tell yourself. I've sort of followed things at the University of Texas, um, which has uh, suffered uh, mightily by just a few trustees who have their own agenda. So um, I've argued that neither faculty nor students nor sometimes trustees are sources of real support for cost control or have the, the institutional knowledge to support a thoughtful approach to cost control on a college campus. But it's also true that other sources are, are making claims upon us which increase our costs as well. The federal government is commonly imposing new requirements on us for reporting, whether that's research reporting, Title IX, or others. Uh, other institutions have tried to, to, to measure the impact of that, usually quite clumsily, but we know that those costs are real. Local governments are always asking us to do more, whether it's pay more in lieu of taxes, to you know, do more to help educate students in the public schools. Um, my point is that while colleges and universities are typically very good at doing more with more, increasingly we are asked to be doing more with less. So if students and faculty and trustees are not likely to be a major support of, of cost control, what actually explains the success of some institutions in reining in costs? Um, uh, as you heard, I was a member of the Lincoln Project, chaired by your former chancellor, uh, Bob Bergenau. Uh, Henry Brady also played a major role in that. And uh, the, the Lincoln Project studied the future of public higher education. Um, and it reported that education and related expenditures, that expenditures for education, grew only 1% annually on a per student basis at public research universities from 2000 to 2012, only 1%, okay? Less than the rate of inflation for the unit cost per student of educating a student. Moreover, the Delta Cost Project of the American Institutes for Research found that in 2012, public research universities uh, actually employed 30 fewer staff per 1,000 full-time equivalent students than in 2002. So, headcount reduced. By contrast, Private research universities employed an additional 137 staff per 1,000 full-time equivalent students over the same period. So it is possible to contain costs, notwithstanding the alignment of the interests that I've just, um, just described. Um, uh, but I think it, if you want to understand why public institutions were successful over that period in controlling costs and privates were not, uh, there's a ready answer. Uh, and it lies in an important observation made by um, a college president with the last name of Bowen. And it's not Bill Bowen, it's Howard Bowen. 
uh, a distinguished scholar of higher education and the economics of higher education, the former president of Grinnell College, the University of Iowa, and the Claremont Graduate uh, University. Howard formulated what became known as Bowen's Law, or more precisely, Bowen's Revenue Theory of Costs. He argued that the unit cost of education is determined by the amount of revenue currently available to the institution to educate students. In other words, institutions spend what they take in. And during the period that we looked at on the Lincoln Project, what happened to public research universities? They took in a lot less because as a consequence of the Great Recession, there was this massive transfer or shifting of, you know, uh, from the taxpayer to students and their families, disinvestment in public education. And um, I suspect that your former chancellor would tell you that absent that loss in revenue, it would have been difficult to do the kinds of things that you had to do uh, to control costs um, on this campus. So I think this theory does a very, very good job of, uh, of explaining why con costs were contained on public university campuses but not on, on privates. We all saw a loss in endowment income, but we did not see the same loss in state support. So I, I fear I've painted a rather bleak picture uh, while I do think cost control is hard, perhaps very hard. I actually don't think it's impossible. Moreover, I don't wish to be heard arguing for less public support for higher education as a way of containing costs. Um, uh, I think that there are, are ways of, uh, of doing it. First, I think that technology does offer us some opportunities I started by noting that the production function for education hadn't changed much in, in, in a long time. Um, and I don't think that bricks and mortar institutions are gonna go the way of the buggy whip. But that said, I think we can learn from what's going on with technology right now. MOOCs have actually developed some very fix successful tools for crowdsourcing um, of grading, um, of advising, and other things. Um, now, I subscribe to the theory that you know, faculty, we teach for free, they pay us to grade. Um, I don't know of any faculty member that would object to the use of technology to reduce the burden on grading. Uh, and similarly, I don't know faculty who would go to the mat to, to ensure that they continue to devote substantial hours advising undergraduates on the optimal path uh, through their education. If we can take what we are learning in some of these experiments and apply them um, in our institutions, I think there are some opportunities, in fact, to enhance productivity and reduce costs. At MIT, there's been some successful experiments with virtual laboratories in the core electrical engineering uh, subject, which has um, reduced the need for expensive physical lab teaching labs, reduced the demand for TAs um, and technical uh, instructors in those courses as well. I think there are opportunities to use technology uh, to teach courses in ways differently than we've done in the past, and in, indeed to connect our alumni to our students in important ways. Harvard Law School, for example, is currently teaching copyright law using virtual TAs who are alumni of the Harvard Law School and who are practitioners who are literally all over the country, um, but rather participate in the class um, through the use of technology. Uh, it allows them to access uh, a teaching resource which they wouldn't have otherwise. People are interested in doing it and actually not get paid for it, which is interesting to me. But I think we need more experiments um, like that, not fewer. Um, I don't want to oversell the prospect of technology, but there are costs associated with each of these strategies, but we have to be open to conversations um, about how we use uh, these technologies in ways that enhance faculty productivity, that don't threaten faculty, and we have to be willing to have a conversation about how we share the fruits of the productivity gains between the faculty and the institution. All right, I think that's essential. Second, if competition drives up costs in higher education, as I think it does, perhaps the time has come to have a bit less of it. We need more cooperation among institutions in shared scientific facilities, in shared library resources, in purchasing, graduate student housing, in the provision of all sorts of back of the house services that are not particularly strategic, but that can be provided more efficiently at scale. And here, I don't think this is likely to save institutions of the size of Berkeley anything. 
But for smaller institutions located in close proximity to others, I think there are real um, opportunities. Um, the Lincoln Project, however, has persuasively argued, in my opinion, that we need more cooperation among institutions um, on the curriculum. We need not replicate every single degree program at every single campus. Uh, we need not replicate every major research facility at every single campus. There needs to be, this competition drives up costs uh, for everyone. Uh, and in a time in which resources to support indirect cost recovery are likely to be uh, under increasing pressure, we need to be creative about how we collaborate around, across institutions. There are also lots of examples of curricular cooperation uh, in Western Massachusetts. Your chancellor designate knows well the cooperation that exists between Amherst, Williams, Smith, Mount Holyoke, and the University of Massachusetts. You know, the Claremont College is engaged in that um, as well. We need to think more about uh, things like that. And now I'm gonna say something which is perhaps quite controversial. Um, but it also requires cooperation among institutions and especially cooperation among, pe among people who lead them. I think the time has come for university leaders to get together and have a serious conversation about how it is that we define tenure. I'm not arguing for the elimination of tenure, far from it. But exactly what constitutes tenure Congress in 1994 in its infinite wisdom eliminated mandatory retirement. At that time in which they did that, there was no faculty member who held tenure who thought that they were gonna work past the age of 70. Originally mandatory retirement originally was at 65, it was bumped to 70. But for those of us who had tenure at the time, myself included, our expectation was that we would have to retire at the age of 70. The law essentially gave each of us a windfall by extending that commitment beyond 70 to a lifetime uh, tenure. Um, in, in doing so, not only was it a windfall to some of us, I think it was enormously expensive for the institutions that employ us. Uh, it was expensive in multiple dimensions. Uh, it made it much harder to intellectually renew our faculty as people stopped stepping aside in favor of their younger colleagues and has resulted in demoralization of a generation of younger scholars um, by reducing their job prospects. It's made it harder for us to diversify our faculty. If you take a look at your faculty over the age of 75, and I suspect you have a few of them, um, they do not look anything like the faculty that you are hiring at the start of their careers um, these days. Um, it increased labor costs because we pay aging faculty more than we pay younger faculty on the way in, and it also increased costs because now in many cases to get people to retire, you have to pay them to step aside. And if you think about it a little bit, this is a highly regressive policy at a time in which institutions are looking for resources anywhere they can find them. The faculty that we are often paying to retire are among the wealthiest among us. They sent their kids to college when college was cheap, I'm talking about myself now and my peers. You know, we bought housing when housing in real terms was less expensive, and we were fortunate enough to be in retirement programs at a time in which equity prices um, have increased substantially. Um, why in a time in which resources are so scarce are we showering these resources on people like me to get us to step aside uh, for an entitlement which we never had when we were granted tenure? So, What's an alternative? I think it's time for leaders of institutions like this, and this can only be done collectively, to think about re uh, redefining tenure as perhaps a contract for a fixed term. 35 years from the date that one received tenure. That's what tenure is. Now, at the end of 35 years, if an institution wanted to, they could extend a term appointment uh, to people. Uh, and if you think that the average person gets tenure maybe at 40, something like that, we're talking about um, essentially asking people to step aside at 75. I would do this on a prospective basis. I would um, be willing to grandfather everybody who currently holds tenure. But I think we need to have a conversation. No single institution can do this on their own. 
it, it requires um, collective, uh, collective action. Um, third, we need to raise money in ways that generate free resources for the institution, that address core needs, unrestricted money. The Hewlett gift that Berkeley received for 100 new chairs is, I think, a wonderful illustration of how an institution needs to raise money to strengthen it both intellectually um, uh, and financially. That requires that we educate our donors who, who care about our institutions to really help us to strengthen them. And then finally, let me turn to the issue of lack of political support for cost control. I think we're unlikely to change the underlying incentives faced by students, faculty, or trustees. However, I think academic leaders can do a much better job of framing choices in ways so that those constituencies understand the real consequences um, of, these, of these choices. During my tenure at Tufts with the concurrence of the faculty, I made undergraduate financial aid our highest priority. Every time a student group or a faculty group came to me advocating for something, um, I would just respond in terms of financial aid equivalents. Are you willing to argue that we should add three additional club sports at the cost of denying financial aid to X number of students at Tufts? Because that's really the choice that you are framing. Uh, that's what you're asking for. We need uh, to do more of that. Um, I think we also need to be willing to have conversations. And here I, I, I'm perhaps skating on, on thin ice a little bit. Uh, with our colleagues in our state legislatures, in which we try to negotiate deals not unlike that which uh, Britt Kerwin, the very successful president of the University of Maryland system, struck with the Maryland state legislature, in which he said quite explicitly, if we succeed in curbing costs in the following manner, will you agree to increase support for the institution so that we can fund these important new initiatives? By stating that very explicitly, Britt gave every constituency on campus um, a stake in cost control. And I think we need, as academic leaders, to make our problems the problems of our students, the problems of our faculty as well. And only if we're willing um, to do that through framing can at least we generate a bit of public support um, for what we are doing. We need to be candid. We need to be upfront. We can't hide from the very real challenges that we face. But in articulating those challenges, we need to give each constituency a stake in the outcome. We have to explain to students and their parents, if we control costs, what we will do for tuition. We need to explain to faculty, if we moderate um, administrative costs, how we are going to, or enhance faculty productivity, how we are going to um, share those with them. So I, I believe the real choice for higher education writ large is whether to find a way to bend the cost curve or risk jeopardizing all of public support for higher education. By the way, nobody has a bigger stake in that than the faculty, because in the end, the faculty are the university. We need to get them engaged in this conversation. Let me conclude just by quoting President Kerr. In the uses of the university, he said, and I quote, and I quote, the call for effectiveness in the use of resources will be perceived by many inside the university world as the best current definition of evil. <laughs> I hope you don't think me evil. I'm under no illusion that this process will be easier or popular but I do think it's necessary to preserve this great institution, um, which has done so much good for this country, the Research University. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, thoughts, reactions? No violent protests, please. Susan. So one of the themes that was... We've got a microphone because oh, we're recording this. One of the themes that was implicit in some of your discussion is that one of the reasons that costs go up is that there's intellectual change over time. In other words, new 
um, discoveries are made, um, new approaches are taken by various disciplines, and that's important for both research and teaching. And one of the things that universities seems to ha seem to have a great deal of difficulty with is giving anything up, stop do doing one thing in order to enable doing other things. Um, do you right. see any way of addressing that? Well, as I, as I said, part of what we need to do is to give a stake to the faculty in doing that. Part of my argument for rethinking tenure as not a lifetime appointment, but rather as a term limited appointment, very long term, necessary to preserve academic freedom. Um, uh, part of doing that is to give institutions the opportunity to reallocate resources. Uh, look, um, none of our private sector institutions would be successful if every time there was a technological development, they were required to maintain the old technology at the same time uh, that they invested in the new one. And in the same way, we need the freedom to invest um, in new intellectual capital, in new realms, but the only way of doing that in, in an era of constrained resources is by disinvesting in other things. So we need more flexibility to do that. I also think there's some clever strategies that can be employed. Uh, when I came to Tufts, I was very pleased to discover that Tufts had created something called an experimental college. The experimental college existed to facilitate experimentation actually in the curriculum. Uh, and so things would occur in the experimental college. They'd be, you know, you could try things out there, uh, often using adjuncts, often using part-time people, and if they took root, then they might actually mature and, and wind up in the curriculum. But there was a rule. No course could be taught in the experimental college for longer than three years. It had to go away. So I think you know, we need to imagine things like that. We need to rethink how we allocate space in universities. In many cases, space is considered an entitlement by a faculty. I own my laboratory forever. Um, you know, we need to think about uh, actually having um, leases on space, formal leases that are drawn up, uh, that are coterminous, coterminous with grants, that create expectations that this scarce resource comes back. A, a subject for a completely different lecture, uh, I think, uh, in the end, space drives costs in universities. Um, you know, and if you build it, they will come. And one of the ways to constrain the growth of resources is by constraining space, by recycling it, by being clever about that. We have not developed those mechanisms for doing that, and I think we need to. Tom? By the way, I don't know everybody's name, but these are <laughs> friends and colleagues. Do you think uh, that your uh, imaginative notion for tenure, which I would certainly support, would survive uh, antitrust action as financial the, aid collaboratives did not? So this is the former dean of a law school. Um, one of the things that I would note is that uh, the current definition of tenure is, exists actually only by the AAUP, right? Which in many cases has been adopted. I, I'm not necessarily calling for a conspiracy. What I'm saying, I, I would actually welcome the opportunity uh, to say, this is how we're going to define tenure in, it's a, as a new contract going forward. Um, it, it might draw scrutiny. There's no question it might draw scrutiny. Um, maybe we need legislative action to permit us to do so. But I would tell you, I have yet to meet a college or university president, and used to be one, who thinks that elimination of mandatory retirement for tenured faculty members was a good idea. Let's take a poll of the current sitting or future chancellors and presidents in this room. Do any of you guys think elimination of mandatory retirement was a good idea? No. <laughs> no, okay. So for tenured faculty, for tenured faculty. What prevents anybody from publicly saying that is the competitive marketplace for faculty, okay? It would require collective action. If it requires an antitrust exemption, then let's go to the federal government and say, you are pushing on us to use resources more efficiently. Um, you, are, you are saying we are profligate. Here's where you can help us to conserve resources. And by the way, in doing that, it will also help us to intellectually renew our faculty. It will help us to diversify our faculty. It will lower our costs. It will allow us to reallocate resources so that they reflect the current intellectual challenges of today. 
And the only thing that's keeping us from doing this is the federal government saying that we can't get together and talk. I would like to see that argument being made, and I am making it. So, yep. Um, oh, there's a question back there with the microphone? Yeah, sorry, I got the mic. Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't see you in the there. dark. Please go ahead. Um, yeah, I'm Charlie Eaton. I'm a postdoc at Stanford PhD in sociology from here. I really loved your talk and your Thank presentation, you. a lot of insightful stuff. Um, and I really liked what you said about there's a collective action problem, and these are things that individual universities, it's really hard for them to do alone. Yep. I wondered if you have some good examples of successes of collective action among universities, because it seems like there are some structural obstacles to collective approaches to these, these kinds of cost control problems. Sure, so there are, there are a number of examples I could offer. Um, Certainly in the area of facilities, for example, um, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, BU, and UMass all got together to collaborate on a high-performance supercomputer uh, facility, okay? So shared scientific facilities, and there are lots of examples about that. I mean, every school does not build its own accelerator, right, Bob? I mean, so um, we've got lots of examples there. Um, lots of examples now uh, in terms of purchasing of institutions getting together and pooling their resources to do it. Again, I'm most familiar with what exists in my neck of the woods, the Boston Consortium now. Interestingly, it was only after the Great Recession um, in 2008 did the, the Boston area universities truly start collaborating on libraries and book exchanges among libraries. Harvard always stood apart, um, and they realized they needed to conserve resources after that as well. Um, a very interesting experiment that's being done between Harvard and Yale right now, one of the most popular courses at Harvard is CS50, a computer science course um, that uh, six, 700 Harvard students take uh, every year. Yale didn't have the equivalent. So the question was, should they buy the course from Harvard or should they make it themselves? And they elected to buy it from Harvard. So CS50 is now being offered at Yale, uh, the same lecturer, from Harvard, David Mallon is, is teaching the course digitally to Yale. It's being staffed locally. If institutions of the caliber of Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Berkeley lead by demonstrate, demonstrating their willingness to buy content from others and use it locally, I think it makes it that much easier for everybody else in higher education uh, to do so. There are other examples. Um, but I think we have a long way to go uh, in order to make that. There's a lot more uh, that can be done. I mean, uh, Harvard and MIT, two miles apart, um, both in need of new performing arts facilities, all right? Um, both in desperate need of it, okay? Why couldn't they get together and build something in Central Square that they could both use, uh, that the city would like? Um, you know, we need more thinking um, like that, and that would be lower cost for everybody. So, um, yes. And then, and then you're next, okay? Yeah, so we'll of, get. Of, of, of the three groups you, you mentioned, the students, faculty, and the board, uh, do you think any is, in fact, aware of the costs? So, and do you think anything could be gained from enlightening them about yeah. the cost? I think this is a, this is a, this is a great question. Um, you know, I'm an economist, um, and we are sometimes accused of knowing, um, you know, the, the price of everything and the value of nothing, okay? And uh, when, we, when we point out the costs of certain things as administrators, it's sometimes heard by others as saying, oh, but what you're really arguing against is innovations in teaching and learning, or better ways of doing research, or you're asking me to spend more of my precious faculty time away from my scholarship because now I have to walk way over there to get, uh, get something done. What we don't do a good enough job, I think, is explaining to our faculty what the cost is of not addressing these issues. All right, not just that it's inefficient, okay, and we could generate resources which could be invested in new intellectual initiatives, but I don't think we do a good enough job of explaining that if we fail to do so, 
the entire financial foundation on which our institutions are based is at risk. Look what's happened in the last several weeks. OK, the secretary of HHS has sort of said, by the way, I don't think we need to pay for indirect costs um, anymore. That would be devastating for institutions like this. And not just for faculty you know, in the sciences. One of the things that's interesting about colleges and universities is that fixed costs are truly fixed. All these indirect costs don't go away. They will have to be supported in some other way, and I guarantee you everybody in this institution and institutions like this will feel it. People need to understand um, that. Um, Mitch McConnell just this past week announced that any review of the federal tax system will include a review of endowments. Now, he didn't say they were going to tax endowments, but it was a shot across the bow, right? And people sort of say, oh, well, we're just going to you know, levy a small tax on endowments, you know? Um, you know, a 1% tax on endowment you know, cuts 20% of your distribution that's available to go to the faculty. Um, it's enormous. Sort of simply saying, oh, we want you to spend more of your endowment in support of students, actually, first of all, it's illegal in many cases, given the way you've raised your money, the way that certain endowments are restricted. But beyond that, it's also true that requiring institutions to spend more of their endowment on educating students actually makes the problem worse, not, not better. I, I think we need to do a better job of educating our faculty about what our faculty have at stake in these choices in the way these choices are being made in Washington, about the way these choices are being made in Sacramento, and in the choices and decisions that we make locally on our campuses. Now that you mentioned the, the, the issue of endowment, I'm changing my question, the question I had. That's all, you're allowed. Um, would you be supportive, given all that you have mentioned with regards to the difficulties of restricted endowment funds. Would you be supportive of a differential deduction for restricted versus non-restricted endowments? Well, um, in fact, uh, one of your faculty members, uh, Mike O'Hare, in the Goldman School, has suggested exactly that strategy when it comes to donations of art to museums. Um, and has suggested that, gee, you know, why do we give the same deduction when uh, the, you know, what's done with the art is restricted by the donor as opposed to if the donor gives the art to the museum and said, do whatever you want with it. You can sell it, you can exhibit it, you can not exhibit it, whatever. So uh, you know, what most people don't understand is that um, philanthropy you know, is terrific for our institutions. That we understand. But it's the taxpayer that writes, you know, a big shadow check that supports it, okay? The tax expenditure aspect of that is coming from the taxpayer, but 100% of that decision is in fact controlled, you know, by the donor in conversation with the institution. Um, I actually, I'd have to think about it a little bit more, but in principle, the notion of giving a larger deduction for an unrestricted gift than a restricted gift, there's a lot to be said for it. Um, our donors need to understand if they really want to help us, they need to give us money in ways that increases our flexibility and doesn't tie our hands with it. One question over here and then, do we have time for just one, one more? Okay, Nick, yeah. Hi, thank you for your talk. You're welcome. Uh, this gentleman who I just met named Hal has a question. He would like to know your opinion about how competent do you think the regents of the University of Michigan are? Oh, th Hal, that's a very good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can't say how competent the, the regents are, but I think I can say that um, I think the notion of selecting regents stewards of an institution as great as the University of Michigan by asking them to run on a, on a party ballot as Democrats or Republicans in a statewide election is unlikely to populate the regents with the kind of expertise that's necessary uh, in order to support an institution of the caliber of the University of Michigan, Michigan becoming even better. 
So, um, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation at the reception afterwards. Thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.